Good afternoon. You guys all know something that I know, and I am delighted to see all of you here. Uh, welcome to AERA 2016. I'm Jeannie Oaks. It is my just distinct pleasure to welcome all of you to this exciting annual meeting, and I hope you enjoy every single moment of it. It is my distinct, every year one of the the great privileges of being president is you get to select someone to give the distinguished research lecture. And it took me about a nanosecond, uh, <laughs> which I think all of you uh, might have the same experience, to, to choose for this year's speaker, uh, Professor Linda Darling Hammond. You know, the theme this year is public scholarship for diverse, to educate diverse democracies. And I can think of no one of all of the hundreds of wonderful scholars I know who work on these issues, but no one who has been more profoundly, more scholarly, and more public around this issue than, than anybody. Uh, Linda, as probably many of you know, is the Charles Dunkemum, is that right? Good enough. Uh, <laughs> professor, professor of Education Emeritus at Stanford University. And you may not know that this year she has founded and become the president of a new research and policy um, organization called the Learning Policy Institute. And I hope she'll tell us a bit about that because it is uh, a, a sen an essence of public scholarship at work. Um, Linda um, has also been at Columbia, as many of you know. She was the founding director of the National Commission on Teaching in America's Future, a report that led to profound changes in the teaching profession. But she's consulted for, for years, as long as I've known her, with federal and state uh, policy leaders and policy makers uh, advising for strategies for both improving education policy generally, but with a particular emphasis on making the school system and schools and teaching and classrooms far more equitable and just than they are. Um, Linda, in, 19, in 2006, in recognition of this work, was named one of the nation's 10 most influential people uh, affecting education policy, and in 2008, she led uh, uh, President Barack Obama's transition team and was a strong and loud voice uh, in, uh, in, in the formation of that agenda, but and particularly a very powerful and compelling and not always successful voice on the need for that agenda to really emphasize education quality and justice and equity for the most underserved kids. Now, this is not all surprising because Linda began her career as a public school teacher in Philadelphia, right? Camden, New Jersey. Camden, New Jersey, right, and then Philadelphia, um, where she founded both a preschool and a public high school, but those were not Linda's first experiences in central city schools in neighborhoods of concentrated poverty. She grew up in Cleveland, uh, where she experienced firsthand both the inequalities and because of the lucky accident of her birth, was a student and a rising scholar at a time when we had a lot of federal programs that were really meant to open up opportunity and provide resources for students coming from, from heavily impact, neighborhoods impacted by poverty and racial isolation. Um, she always wanted to change society to be more equitable from the very beginning. And she said, uh, she and I talked about this the other day, that at her heart, she is a teacher and an advocate, but that she knew early on uh, from her days as a teacher that she needed to become a rigorous and scrupulous researcher in order to be a strong voice in American education policy. Now, I met Linda in 1985. Hard to believe she was, you know, 31 years ago, she was a mere child. Um, but I met her because she hired me to be part of her team at the Rand Corporation, where she was already proven to be both a rigorous and scrupulous researcher and a strong and solid voice 
for good policy, but especially for equitable and just policy in American schools. So it is my great pleasure to introduce and welcome to the, the podium my colleague and good friend, Linda Darling-Hammond. Thank you for that amazing introduction. Um, and I'm wondering, it looks like somebody is, the way the... Um, Hold somebody is this, here, right? Yeah, can, yeah, I wonder if we can tilt the um, projector a little bit. Or maybe... <laughs> Off with her head, no. <laughs> totally teasing. <laughs> That, no, that, that worked. Okay, I'm sorry. Thank you for all for being here and all along the sides. Actually, there's a little room on the sides here if some people in the hall want to get in. Uh, this is a hot topic, the new accountability, and a moment for public scholarship, I think, for everyone in our profession. Jeannie asked me to say a word about the Learning Policy Institute, and I'll just say a word. Um, the Learning Policy Institute aims to bring evidence, strong evidence from the work that we do and the work that others of you do into the policy arena uh, by creating relationships with organizations that are engaged in policy and policymakers themselves uh, around the goal of promoting equitable and empowering learning. Uh, often policy has little to do with learning and may even be hostile to learning that is equitable and empowering. Uh, and there's a, a huge chasm uh, between the worlds of practice, research, and policy at this moment in our history. And we hope to build at least a rope bridge across there and work uh, productively with members of the policy community. And I'm gonna tell some stories this afternoon about that kind of work uh, to connect uh, the work of excellent practitioners who have found uh, solutions and strategies that work, uh, those of researchers who are looking to understand and generalize uh, from theory and practice uh, to uh, broader uh, principles, and those of policymakers who are looking to create public schools that can succeed for all children. Um, Part of this is getting past the image of policymaking that I think Jeannie and I learned about when we were both at the Rand Corporation. Uh, as a young scholar, I sort of thought that what you would do is write, uh, do a study and write up your study and publish your study in a monograph, maybe even in a journal, and policymakers would find it <laughs> and read it and immediately act on what you recommended. That was the idea that I was disabused of uh, fairly early on, but I think that we still have the problem in our field that many folks uh, kind of do their research and throw it up over the wall and hope that it comes down and hits a policymaker on the head, and thereby better policy will be made. So I, I want to talk about both the process of the work and also the amazing a uh, field of opportunity that is uh, available right now as we are in a shift in our policy framework in this country. Uh, it's a very important moment. Uh, so I'm gonna take us back uh, to 2002, January 8th, and this is how many of us felt when we saw that No Child Left Behind had been signed into law. There was that sort of shocking moment uh, because many people in the practice and research communities um, were aware from the very beginning that this law would have a tortured uh, existence until it finally was changed. Uh, and then on uh, December 11th, 2015, No Child Left Behind was left behind. <laughs> now I'm a former English teacher, so I like English teacher cartoons. This one says, today you're going to learn the meaning of irony. And so why was NCLB so ironic? Well, it was passed on the heels of 9-11 as a, uh, a symbol 
of coming together, you know, to, uh, Democrats and Republicans getting something done to move the nation forward. Uh, it was passed with almost no input from the education or the research communities. The law had noble goals uh, to indeed leave no child left behind to uh, enact greater equity. It had important insights about the transparency of data for attention to equity and the uh, disaggregation of data for different groups of students, the aspiration to see progress made and a closing of the gap uh, was appropriate and noble. But it sought to achieve those goals with extremely problematic strategies for school change. Uh, and we have uh, seen the march over the last subsequent years to the point where uh, as we try to uh, get 100% of schools to uh, reach proficiency for every subgroup that virtually every school in the country was declared, every public school was declared uh, in need of improvement or failing because the targets could not be met. The NCLB theory of action was if we focus on school achievement tied to incentives and sanctions, educators and policymakers will improve education. The strategies were to require annual testing, to set targets to reach 100% proficiency overall and for subgroups. Um, embedded in those, some of you will know, was the um, English learner catch-22, because that group was supposed to get to 100% proficient, but whenever kids became proficient, they were taken out of the group. And I, I don't know how many of us had how many conversations with people in Washington about the fact that that you know, was, was uh, not going to ever be accomplishable, and um, states like California and others that have a lot of English learners found those schools immediately declared in need of improvement because the faster they made kids proficient, the faster they were declared failing by the rules of the law. Uh, a strategy to identify schools that fail to meet all targets. If you were in a diverse school, you might have 30 plus targets that you needed to meet for all of the subgroups in a given year. If you met you know, all but one, you were still declared uh, in need of improvement or failing, depending on how far down the track you were. Uh, then, of course, implementing school consequences, which were predetermined by the federal government in terms of what those consequences could be. You could reconstitute the school, fire the principal, uh, hire new teachers, turn it into a charter, um, implement certain kinds of um, uh, strategies for improvement and so on. And then under waivers, the next part of the strategy was to tie uh, student test scores to teacher evaluation. So that's really been the framework for school improvement. And what essentially happened during that era was that test-based accountability became the idea of school improvement. Uh, in the country. It really created the entire parameter. Uh, and uh, very early on, members of AERA understood that this would be problematic. In his presidential address in 2003, just a year after the law was passed, and really the same year that it was beginning to be implemented, Rob, Bob Lynn did his talk on accountability, responsibility, and reasonable expectations. And before I tell you what he said, I just want to take a moment uh, and think about Bob, he passed away this year. He was an amazing member of our community. So let's just take a moment for, of silence for him. As in all things, Bob was very per perspic perspicacious. I think that's the word. Uh, smart guy, knew what he was talking about. He uh, looked at that point at the trends on the National Assessment of Educational Progress, which was supposed to be the benchmark for deciding on proficiency. And he said, here's where we've been in reading uh, in recent years. You can see the observed trends for grades 4, 8, and 12. And then he said, what would we need to do to uh, reach 100% proficiency by 2014? And those are the steep slope lines going straight up uh, after that point in time. He did a similar exercise in mathematics. And then he calculated. Uh, what the projections to reach 100% proficiency would take if we continue to improve at that rate, 57 years for grade 
64, mathematics 61 for grade 8, 166 years for grade 12 mathematics, and then he calculated out. And of, of course, uh, his point was that we really need to rethink accountability, that true accountability requires broadly shared responsibility, not just at the level of the school, but the level of the district and the state. Uh, system designs need to be informed by research and experience, not just drawn out of thin air. Performance expectations need to be ambitious but realistically attainable and meet some kind of existence proof test uh, to legislate nationally that something should occur that had never happened before and nev no one had ever tested to see if it could happen uh, seems a little bit irresponsible. But he also made the point that researchers need to share responsibility, that we need to be producing dependable information about strengths and weaknesses of interventions and educational strategies. And we need to do that not just for the single studies that we individually do, but we need to know our field and all the work that's come before. That's what makes us a profession, is that we build on each other's work so that we can speak to the policy and the practice community about the weight of the evidence and when something is likely to work under what circumstances implemented in what way. We also need to produce dependable information about features of accountability systems that enhance the likelihood of positive influence on education while minimizing unintended negative side effects. Well, we have been busy this last decade or so producing a lot of research about the unintended negative side effects of No Child Left Behind, which grew a lot of different um, acronyms and, and uh, slogans over the course of that time. I've heard it called No Child Left Untested, No Child's Behind Left, uh, <laughs> m many other things. Uh, and when I was working with um, President Obama in 2008 as part of the campaign, but I also was talking to people in uh, Senator Clinton and Senator Biden's offices and with them about their education ideas, they were all stunned when they left Washington went out into the country and heard people talking about what the effects of federal policy were on their schools. Uh, it was interesting to me to realize what a bubble Washington, D.C. is uh, because the conversations many people were having, you were probably part of some of them, were not reaching the uh, folks who had enacted the policy and were uh, just coming out into the hinterlands at that time. Thank you so much. This is a psychic person. I appreciate you. <laughs> if you sold those, you can make some money right now. I'm just saying. One dollar. <laughs> you know what they say, monetize it, right? Uh, so we, we did have a lot of research, uh, and I can't even begin to talk about all of it. There was research about how uh, the curriculum and teaching were being narrowed both in terms of fewer content areas being taught in schools, particularly those serving low-income students, students of color, English learners, where the threat of sanctions was severe, the curriculum lost science, it lost social studies, quite often art and PE and other things. It also became more focused on the methodologies of multiple choice testing, so kids were drilling on how to find one answer out of five rather than how to communicate orally and in writing, how to inquire, how to investigate, how to prepare for the world outside of school. Incentives to push out and keep out low performers also came to light, and I want to acknowledge the Harvard UCLA Civil Rights Project had a whole series of research that began to raise these concerns and issues about how a law intended to work on behalf of the highest need students was in fact restricting the learning opportunities of those very students. The National Research Council did a number of reports, one of them on the effects of test high stakes test-based accountability and the fact that it has not moved the needle uh, forward on learning. The RAND Corporation raised questions early on uh, about the uh, true uh, learning effects that uh, could be parsed out from test scores, the Center on Education Policy, and many, many others. So uh, there was a cottage industry one of the things that was found, and this was by Julian Vasquez Heilig, uh, one of my students at the time, but now uh, a, a major figure uh, in the field of public scholarship, um, 
was that the Texas miracle, which had started No Child Left Behind, if, if you're old enough, you'll remember the conversations about the Texas miracle, it looked like on the TOS tests uh, that there were these huge gains in achievement. And people saw this graph. It was circulated widely in Washington and graphs like it to say, well, wouldn't we want to do this nationwide? And of course, George Bush had been the governor in Texas. He was the president at the time. <clears throat> so uh, Julian did a study uh, in what came to be called Brazos City. Um, and one of the things he discovered, getting all of the data for all of the kids over about a 15-year period and tracking their progress through school was that first of all the Stanford 9 tests which were low stakes tests uh, showed little gain. Uh, in fact it's you know, reasonably a little tiny gain and then drop again uh, and little closing of the gap between students of different groups at odds with the TAS data. So what was going on there? Uh, the other thing that he found uh, was that um, many of the high schools, uh, well the high schools as a whole uh, were losing a lot of students. So these are four cohorts of kids who entered ninth grade at the top of each of those lines and the number who departed uh, four years later uh, was about 30 percent of those who entered. Uh, and investigating qualitatively as well as quantitatively what was going on, on there, what he found is that large numbers of students, sometimes as many as 25 percent in the elementary schools, were being held out of testing by being labeled English learners or students with disabilities or being redshirted on testing day and just told to stay home. Uh, they had figured out that if they retained students in ninth grade, uh, they wouldn't take the 10th grade accountability test. A lot of the ninth graders never did uh, graduate and just got stuck in the ninth grade, but some managed to get enough credits to be skipped over to 11th grade, but they still never took the 10th grade test. <clears throat> and then there were large rates of disappearances. Uh, which just, they just, kids just vanished from the uh, database without uh, a code. So it began to look like, in fact, uh, part of the uh, story of uh, test-based accountability was figuring out how to get the scores, average scores boost, rather than uh, necessarily being able to educate all of the kids well. There were a lot of other research findings that had come out on the outcomes of high-stakes testing uh, without investing. Uh, because recall that resources were not on the table here. Uh, the theory was that the testing alone uh, would, um, would do the trick, and uh, you're all familiar with the large gaps in funding that uh, we have across states and within states to different districts uh, where there is uh, usually a three to one ratio between high and low spending districts and dis inequalities within districts to different schools. Uh, so among those were findings that we were experiencing a more road-oriented curriculum. There were higher rates in many states of grade retention. Studies in Georgia, Massachusetts, South Carolina, New York, Florida, Texas found increasing dropout and push-out rates. Studies in Florida, Georgia, and Texas were documenting the loss of good teachers from low-ranked schools because of the punitive effects of the system. And then, of course, continued inequality in resources because the theory of change didn't include uh, paying for um, more teachers or different uh, programs or supports for kids in so-called failing schools. Lori Shepard's presidential address in 2000 featured a slide somewhat like this one, uh, which, in which she warned about the effects of low-quality, high-stakes testing. And in fact, we saw some of those outcomes. So what happened at the, uh, as a result? Uh, well, the best case scenario of outcomes from No Child Left Behind was fourth grade math scores. There was very little movement at eighth or twelfth grade, uh, almost no movement in reading. Uh, but fourth grade math, we did see some improvements. But the rate of gain uh, pre-NCLB was much steeper than the rate of gain post-NCLB. So whatever we were doing in the 1990s was moving the dial faster than what happened uh, in the... Um, uh, 2000s, and this is on the National Assessment of Educational Progress. Uh, now, you would think that with all the testing, because we tripled the amount of testing, we would be among the best test takers in the world. Uh, but on PISA, the international assessments, uh, we actually saw a decline in math, science, and reading between 2000 and 2012. 
Uh, so uh, there are lots of reasons for this, including the increase in poverty and homelessness and uh, a variety of other issues. Uh, but uh, we weren't addressing those. We were just uh, focused on sanctions for testing, and that obviously was not uh, moving the bar. The other thing about PISA is that it's a very different kind of assessment from most of what we use in the United States. Uh, because uh, two-thirds of it is open-ended questions, it asks students to apply their knowledge to solving a different problem, uh, working with the material that's offered to them, which uh, is very different from just finding one answer out of five. And our kids usually do the least well on the problem-solving elements. So why haven't outcomes improved more? Well, for one thing, our state tests focused on low-level skills, and we actually went backwards in the quality of testing, because in the 1990s, a variety of states, about 15 of them, had built assessment systems that looked very much like those in many other countries, like the UK, Australia, Singapore, Hong Kong, and so on, where kids are doing uh, open-ended uh, essays, uh, problem solutions, and even projects that are part of the assessment system, scientific investigations, uh, social science inquiry. Uh, almost all the testing uh, became multiple choice. States stopped making their own tests and bought tests uh, off the shelf. The Department of Education did not want to approve any of the performance-based assessments that were uh, being used in states. You may recall that Vermont and Kentucky had portfolios, um, and uh, Maryland had performance tasks. Connecticut had uh, performance tasks and even sued the department to be able to keep them up, and they were told to just uh, shift to multiple choice tests. There were no incentives for enriching the curriculum because uh, we weren't looking at or caring about science, social studies, or other aspects of the curriculum. And you know, one of the places where I think we really missed the boat on this, and I agree with Edie Hirsch on this, uh, that when you're learning to read, you have to read in content and learn uh, about things that you will then bring to your reading to be able to progress in reading. So just drilling on little passages and then bubbling in one answer out of five about a fact in a passage doesn't actually allow you to move to the higher levels of comprehension and use of um, reading material that we need in middle and high school, which is why we saw that our gains were almost exclusively in the elementary schools and not at the middle and the high school level. The drivers of achievement were invisible because we were only reporting and making, uh, keeping tabs on test scores. <clears throat> so other things that might make a difference were not uh, being looked at or on the table. Mandated solutions were often unhelpful. Uh, in California, uh, quite often the mandated solution was to eliminate all the content areas for low-scoring kids, give them two hours of literacy and two hours of math a day with nothing else around it, and uh, it was unengaging, uninteresting, uh, failing to trigger higher order thinking skills or critical problem solving, um, and so that was not unusual across the country. And the focus on schools and teachers left important factors out of the mix. Uh, growing poverty and homelessness, we doubled the number of homeless children in the last decade, uh, we have more children in poverty, one out of, almost one out of four, than we had in the 1970s and way more than any other country uh, in the industrialized world. Uh, inequality in school resources was not to be discussed. All of those were excuses. State and district policies were also off the table. Schools, little schools were supposed to fix themselves, even if they'd been deprived of qualified teachers and adequate resources and the programs that they needed by that very state or district in which they uh, sat. Standardized testing increased dramatically by 300 uh, percent as it was required in more grade levels, and that's one of the reasons states couldn't afford to keep up the more performance-oriented assessments. Uh, as of a survey a, a year or so ago, teachers were reporting that 85 percent said it the testing they experienced undermines good teaching, uh, and 45% said it makes them consider leaving the profession, and some certainly have done so. As one Texas teacher put it, I've seen more students who can pass the test, but cannot apply those skills to anything if it's not in the test format. 
As for higher quality teaching, I'm not sure I would call it that. And many teachers have talked about what they were not able to do in order to um, focus on, on this. And of course, we've seen recently that students and parents are beginning to opt out. New York, of course, has been one of the places where that's uh, substantially the case. Uh, there's a national opt-out movement. Uh, and the question is now before us, can we develop a more productive approach to accountability. And I would argue that accountability is not a side issue. It has become the issue for how we think about the improvement of schools. So that question was coming up and coming up and coming up over the last few years. And um, with the support of the Hewlett Foundation, a group of folks uh, met together to sort of ask that question, can we develop a, a more productive approach to accountability? And what you see in the list of people who contributed to a report that I'm gonna talk about is that there were uh, researchers uh, highlighted in yellow, there were uh, educators from school district state levels uh, who were in various um, practice and policy positions, and then in, in blue and then in purple, others who were policy uh, analysts, advisors, actors uh, of some prominence in uh, various administrations. And uh, this group got together and brainstormed about what would a new accountability system for college and career readiness really look like? Could we get a new paradigm? Uh, began to talk about a set of new principles. Uh, they began with the idea that accountability does not equal testing that really accountability should be about, if you have an accountable system, it would encourage high quality teaching and learning in all schools, it would provide tools for continuous improvement, and it would provide means for identifying and addressing problems that require correction. Tests can offer information for an accountability system, but they do not by themselves create accountability. And think about it as a parent. You know, what parent goes to up to a school and says, here's what I want you to do for my child. Can you please give them a lot of tests and give me numbers that describe them? I have not met that parent. So we thought about what would uh, parents want from an accountability system. Well, the first thing you want is meaningful learning. You want kids to be focusing on the kind of learning that is empowering and engaging and prepares them for the life that they're going to encounter in the world outside of school. And that life is, as you all know, changing very rapidly. Um, as a Stanford professor, I don't usually like to quote people from Cal Berkeley. <laughs> and I bet there's somebody here in the room from Cal. There almost always is. Where are you guys? There you, yeah. Um, but there are these two professors at Cal who've been doing these studies of the growth of knowledge in the world. And they discovered that between 1999 and 2003, there was more new knowledge created in the world than in the entire history of the world preceding. Think about it. And now knowledge growth is on an exponential curve. Technology knowledge is doubling every 11 months. And by the time I finish this talk, it'll probably be every 10 months. It's uh, the rate, and so our kids are going into a world where they will work with knowledge that hasn't been discovered yet, using technologies that have not been invented yet to solve problems that we have not managed to solve. So just dividing up the curriculum into the 12 years of school and saying we're gonna hand it out to you in dollops and if you just memorize this and spit it back, you'll be baked and done does not constitute meaningful learning for the world that they are entering. Uh, so we need to think about what would that meaningful learning be and then how do we organize curriculum instruction assessment around that. Parents will tell you we want solid professionals in the schools. We want the people who teach our kids and work with our kids to know what they're doing to know how kids learn and to be able to uh, meet the needs of our individual brilliant students because each of us has the most brilliant student that was ever that ever crossed the <laughs> threshold into that school and that's a form of professional accountability and professional capacity and then Parents will say, we want the resources there, the materials and whatever else it takes for the kids to do that work uh, for that meaningful learning to occur. So if you start from there and you say that's the foundation of an accountability system, then what does that mean for how 
uh, our whole approach would change. Well, those ideas began to be discussed. Uh, the group actually posited a 51st state. And so what would a 51st state do? Since then, a group of states have come together as the 51st state accountability group to try to enact some of that work. A variety of other groups began to take this question up. What could be the new principles for accountability? A group of civil rights groups issued a statement and a letter to the President and the Congress about principles uh, for, account for a new accountability, uh, educator groups, uh, AFT, NEA, administrators, PTA, Parents United and others also did the same thing. Uh, some of us helped organize meetings so that that conversation could go on, uh, many of them here in Washington, but some of them all around the country. And people came to some agreement. Mostly they said we should have accountability that's organized around system improvement that it should be reciprocal. Every system level should have responsibility for the things it needs to do to make children learn. It should focus on this kind of meaningful learning with more valid forms of assessment, uh, continuing to report them in disaggregated form. We should have adequate resources that are allocated intelligently, develop professional capacity uh, as well as accountability, use multiple measures to figure out what uh, students are learning and what schools are doing. Uh, focus on shifting from test and punish to assess, support, and improve, and reflect uh, student, parent, educator, community input and involvement in that process. And some states have been moving ahead to design and develop systems like this. California was one of the earliest ones because we had a governor who said, uh, I can do what California needs or I can do what Washington's telling me to do, I'm going to do what California needs and just kind of started marching in a different direction. So we have a new theory of action. The new theory of action might be described as if we focus on what matters for learning and require attention to continuous improvement, education will improve. The strategies involve improving the quality of curriculum and assessment, investing in educator and school capacity, encouraging a dashboard approach. Uh, with uh, multiple indicators reflecting not only student success, but also their engagement in school and their opportunities to learn. Put equity and resources back on the table. What do kids get the opportunity to learn? Because uh, if you don't know what they have the opportunity to learn, how can you figure out if they're not learning what caused it? And then develop systems for school review. So we now have the Every Student Succeeds Act, is it more of the same or is it a new start? And the first thing to know about that is that the accountability systems will largely be designed by the states. So it's up to you and your colleagues in your state what accountability and school improvement will mean. The secretary, this is uh, unusual. There are about 15 things the secretary in the law is not allowed to regulate or prescribe. Among them is teacher evaluation, uh, also the design of the accountability system. Multiple measures are required. There are five measures that must be used, uh, English language arts, math, science, assessment scores, um, ELA and math in the same grade levels that we've seen before, and science once every grade span, English language proficiency gains, graduation rates must be included, and then at least one indicator that is uh, about school climate or student success or opportunity to learn, but states can do much more than that one, and some are looking at a dozen indicators uh, to give a more complete picture of what's going on in their school. Uh, the nature of tests and their uses can change. In fact, the law says the assessments must measure higher order skills and may include performance tasks and portfolios. There are more incentives in the law for well-designed professional learning for teachers and leaders. Some of the research that was being done and communicated found its way in about what constitutes high-quality professional learning and development. More incentives for community schools, which we haven't seen since the 1990s in the old version of the law, which can provide wraparound services and a lot of the other things that students need to be ready to learn. School integration is back on the agenda. We haven't seen that since the 1970s. It was eliminated in the 1980s uh, from all of the federal investment. Uh, high school redesign is on the agenda. 
Um, resource equity is actually in the law. There's required reporting of dollars, expenditures, resources for schools. Uh, there are incentives for districts to adopt weighted student formulas. There are resource audits and investments that must be conducted when schools uh, are identified as needing assistance. This is a huge change in the framework of the law. There's a lot of work to be done, and this is where you come in. We have to figure out uh, all across the country how to define, design, and implement new accountability and improvement systems. We need to think about the nature of assessments and build assessments that reflect the skills, uh, use them in ways that are for information and improvement rather than for sanctions and punishments. The nature and role of educator development is on the table and the design of schools that can support stronger learning. What can inform this work? Well, there's a lot that we can learn from the, uh, our own work in the states, but also from abroad. And I've put up here the Singapore Education Examinations and Assessment Board uh, and the Alberta report, uh, Results Report, which is a multiple measure system they've been using in Alberta, Canada for a long time. Uh, Singapore is a place that in order to move to a thinking schools learning nation framework has been doing project-based examinations and assessments for a number of years um, and bringing their curriculum um, into the 21st century. We may want to go back to the future uh, because in the 1990s, a lot of this was happening in the United States and understanding what worked then and what we learned from that is going to be important. During that time, Connecticut, Massachusetts, Kentucky, and North Carolina were all studied as states that had very large gains in achievement because of very systemic approaches to reform. Kentucky and North Carolina uh, both were southern states that could have broke the glass ceiling of getting above the national average. Connecticut became number one in achievement in 1996. Massachusetts surpassed them by 1998. Uh, all of them had similar things going on. They raised and equalized teacher salaries and in some cases uh, did that by uh, equalizing school funding or had that school funding equalization as a result. Uh, they all launched preschool and children's health initiatives. They raised standards for teaching and teacher education. They offered service scholarships to attract and prepare teachers of color and teachers in high need fields and teachers who would go to high need locations. Mentoring, uh, high quality professional development. Uh, they revised assessments uh, and they pursued steady policies for more than 15 years. Many of these began to uh, falter. Um, in the last decade, but some have held on to a lot of the practices that they developed. More recently, the New Jersey story, which I love because I started student teaching in Camden, New Jersey, where there were no books in the book room, there were no resources, there were court cases for 30 years where the state refused to put the same amount of money in the high minority, low income school districts of Newark, Camden, Patterson, Trenton, et cetera, as they put in Princeton and New Brunswick. And after nine court cases telling them to equalize the funding, finally in 1998, Christy Todd Whitman did bring parity funding to those districts, but they also did many of the same things those other states had done. High quality preschool, teacher education and professional development, focused literacy and math programs, a whole school reform, and the most successful were those that organized around the Comer models, Jim's Comer's school development model, which supports child development and learning of child development by all the members of the community. And uh, they then took fire uh, became one of the highest achieving states in the nation. They are now always in the top five, closed the achievement gap in half uh, because they pursued uh, this set of reforms together. And in fact, of all the top achieving states, which include Connecticut, Massachusetts, New Jersey, typically also Vermont and uh, often New Hampshire, uh, New Jersey is the one that has uh, the largest proportion of students of color, 45%, and about a third of the kids live in poverty and they're still uh, performing well because they're making investments in smart ways. Today there's an innovation lab network that is working with a variety of states under the auspices of the Council of Chief State School Officers uh, to try to move the needle on uh, 21st century learning and new approaches to accountability and assessment. And a group of scholars uh, and centers works with them and with the chiefs 
from University of Kentucky, University of Oregon, Stanford, uh, and so on, Center for Collaborative Education is in New England. Uh, hand in glove, thinking about what do we know, how might that help you, envision what you might do, how do we test it and pilot it. We've piloted new assessments, uh, refined them, new accountability systems are being developed. How can you share that knowledge with each other across policymakers in the states? Uh, how can practitioners be part of the conversation so that the di so their districts at the table saying this is what would help us? And then how can scholars help document, capture, contribute, uh, and learn from and spread those lessons? And I think when we work in public scholarship and we want to change the way that policy unfolds, we have to work across these role groups. We have to work with one another to figure out how to move forward. So uh, California, as I said, moved to a multiple measures system a little while ago as part of its school ref finance reforms, which now allocate funding based on student needs, poverty status, English learner status, foster care status, and ask every district to figure out how to allocate those new funds with their community involved, with teachers and educators involved, uh, around these eight state priorities. Uh, which then constitute a way to look at school progress. Uh, communities say, here's what we're going to work on, what we think we need to do. Here are the measures we're going to use to evaluate our progress. And then we're going to keep iterating each year as we see what's working, what's not working, and so on. The core districts in California are the largest districts, Los Angeles, San Francisco, Long Beach, Fresno, et cetera. They've developed a, an approach to accountability which has an academic domain. Uh, a set of academic indicators, a social-emotional domain. They're looking at social-emotional learning and climate and culture in the schools, as well as suspension and expulsion rates. You know that one of the biggest uh, barriers in many schools is the high rate of suspension and expulsion that is disproportionate for students of color. So measuring that as the state is doing and as these districts are and holding themselves accountable for finding new approaches to social emotional skill development, to restorative justice, uh, is bringing those exclusionary tactics down. Uh, measuring chronic absenteeism and holding oneself accountable for figuring out how to meet the needs of kids who are being kept out of school. And then of course culture and climate. Uh, so there's a, a way by which you can begin to think about the whole child, the whole school, all of the elements that may make a difference, uh, and redesign the way we think about what we're paying attention to and what our continuous improvement uh, strategies are about. In the core districts, if a schools are found to be uh, struggling on a number of these indicators, they undertake a school quality review in which experts, kind of like the inspectorates that you know of from some other countries, but a little more democratic. Uh, so there's peers who come in along with some experts who look at the data, they look at the teaching, they look at the learning, they look at student work, they look at classroom practice, uh, and then they help develop a diagnostic for what could be done. Uh, developing a, a, a continuously improving system figuring out how to provide learning supports and information, ongoing review, innovation, and knowledge sharing is on the table. How do we do that? It should not be the case. Anywhere in this country, with all the knowledge we produce, we have the most active, well-used research uh, body and community in this country of any country in the world. Everybody comes here and studies our innovations and uses our research. But do we use it? Not so much. Uh, we, because of this divide between policy, research, and practice, we've got to figure out how to build these systems. So it should not be the case that if I'm in a district, um, you know, stay in California, which is my current home, uh, where we are uh, struggling to make progress with English language learners, don't know what to do, don't know what has succeeded elsewhere, uh, I should not have to go running around looking under rocks to figure out where that knowledge is. And the truth is, I'm sorry to say it, I'm not going to read the AERA journals to find it. It's not likely. Uh, somebody's got to synthesize that knowledge. Uh, 
departments of education might do this. Researchers might partner in this um, to say, here's where, here's uh, what we know from across multiple studies. Uh, here are strategies that might be productive in different contexts. Here's the kind of implementation uh, that we know is important. Here are places, districts and schools that are succeeding. You can go look at them. You can go visit. You can talk. We can document what they're doing. We can help make that knowledge shareable. So if we want to have a system in which knowledge and action are in sync, we've got to figure out how to make the knowledge available to those who need it where they need it, in the way that they can use it, uh, so that they can move forward. We need to figure out what kind of assessment is going to be uh, prevalent in this new system. Are we going to continue to look like that, or the analog with computers? Or will we get to the place where we're really engaged in the kind of performance assessments that our kids would experience if they were in Queensland, Australia, or Victoria, or Singapore, or the UK, where they're actually engaged in investigations, writing them up, and being evaluated? Uh, that Innovation Lab Network has created a performance assessment resource bank, which is full of performance tasks that illustrate this. They're trying to move along the continuum from where we've been, measuring low-level skills, uh, Rand found, by the way, that in the states with the highest standards, 98% of the math items were low level. Only 2% measured higher order thinking skills. 80% of the English language arts me measures were low level. Only 20% me measured higher order thinking skills. So we're counting ourselves out of the global um, knowledge game if we don't move along this continuum to where um, some other countries and some schools in the United States are where they engage in performance-based tasks, extended tasks like those that the Innovation Lab Network is pulling together, even student-designed uh, projects. In Singapore, your science examination will be a practical assessment where you essentially identify a problem, uh, do an experiment, uh, record it, and write up a little science journal article. Um, in the Innovation Lab Network, Things like these math performance tasks begin to be what teachers can work around. Uh, they've been piloted in the states. This one has kids uh, figure out the rising costs of colleges in an in-state community college, out-of-state college, and an Ivy League college, and then write an article, uh, equations that map the uh, slope of the increases and an article about the rising costs of college. The states are also working on professional capacity building. Uh, you can see in places like Iowa, where they've got a major initiative around teacher leadership. In Kentucky, where they're rebuilding subject matter networks. California has an innovative instructional leadership core where teachers are learning to uh, provide professional development to their colleagues in their districts to build capacity around the new standards. Uh, teachers involved in design and scoring of performance assessments, which we know builds their capacity and knowledge of the standards and so on, uh, and school quality reviews in Vermont. So there are lots of places to go study where elements are being put in place. There are lots of places looking for information about what kind of evidence-based interventions will be helpful to us. Uh, so what can we contribute? We need to think about what have we learned in terms of strategies for school improvement and supportive learning. We need to think about what we've learned in terms of policy and implementation strategies. Where and how can that learning be applied? Where can partnerships be made for, with those in districts, uh, in states, uh, in networks who are looking to move forward? Uh, what's, we need to keep track of what's working and not working uh, and why. Uh, because in this new era, we should have a continuous uh, assessment and evaluation process going on. Uh, to track what's being done and to inform all of the actors about what's working uh, and what needs to be amended and refined to create this virtuous cycle of improvement and learning. In Finland, they call that, which is their major form of uh, improvement, they call that intelligent accountability. Uh, it's all about the learning, uh, the evaluation and the learning. So we have uh, a real uh, challenge in front of us. It's a moment where public scholarship can make an enormous difference. Many years ago, Horace Mann made the comment that where anything is growing, one former 
is worth a thousand reformers. I think that's a good challenge to take up. May the force be with you. <laughs>
Maybe that little bit of stuff about the earthworm, because they asked a lot of questions about the earthworm. <laughs> but other than that, so meaningful knowledge, we use it, we apply it. Uh, it's why problem-based and project-based learning can be productive when it's well-designed. It's not the only way, but why inquiry is a, an important piece of the learning process because it motivates uh, the capacity to apply and develop meaning. Yes. <laughs> Waving hands. Uh, this will be an interesting thing to see if you can get there. This is your performance task. Thank you. As a former Regents uh, test taker. Oh. Um, this is possibly the most upbeat session you could have possibly given on this subject. <laughs> um, and coming from a state which is charged with trying to actually do something new with accountability, which is desperately needed, I'm also a bit depressed because I feel like we've lost ground in how, however many years since No Child Left Behind. You're describing a process that, that would require an unbelievable investment. And so my question to you is you, you've been talking about the Policy Institute work, which sounds wonderful. Do you have sort of, uh, have, have you stepped it down in some way so it's not just, you know, let's go from here to here and spend, you know, five bazillion dollars and hope for the best? Because that's, not, that's, that's <laughs> one issue for policymakers, right? Thank you. Um, I just, by the way, heard from Judith Johnson, who's one of the new regents, uh, about the work that's going on in, in New York, and we'll probably be talking with them uh, as they get going. You know, there, there, are fin there are money and resource aspects of this. However, I don't think it's all about the money. We have wasted a lot of money um, you know, in trying to get a system to work that cannot work without investing in capacity. Uh, and educators, um, in my experience, are so hungry for sensible, supportive strategies. So yes, there will be investments needed. You said it would be bazillions. Did I hear that? <laughs> I wasn't sure if it was gazillions or bazillions, but but something like that, and um, I'm not sure if it will be bazillions. I think it's how we spend our resources. Yes, we're going to have to spend more of them, but um, we need to invest in uh, strategies that provide more access to knowledge and supports to educators and less in elaborate uh, teacher-proof curriculum and data systems that come and go and never succeed because children are not standardized and the problems of practice have to be worked out with people in community. One of the things I was just, I came here from another conference that the Shanker Institute is holding on uh, the social side of education and what collaboration means. Uh, and there's a growing body of research on how when you can plant collaborative uh, opportunities for uh, joint planning, for developing and evaluating student work together, for uh, peer observation, et cetera, uh, you get much stronger achievement gains. Uh, teacher, the returns to teacher experience, that is their growing effectiveness which does increase all the way up to 20 or 25 years when you look at some of the recent studies that are coming out, uh, takes an even steeper slope when they're in a collaborative environment, right, where they're learning and sharing. So there's some fundamental strategies that, uh, with some others, that you know, infuse uh, the right kind of knowledge and supports for kids. Um, will really make a big difference in what educators are able to do, especially if they're not trying to do the gaming that was going on during the NCLB era to just try to boost the average scores and who do you keep out and who do you push out and how do you work with the bubble kids and you know all of the other mishigash is what my 
friend Ann Lieberman taught me. <laughs> um, so I, I think, yes, there, there are resources, but I think it's how we spend our energy and time and resource that's going to make the important difference. Um, the other thing, of course, that we need to be talking about, however, is an anti-poverty program in this country, investments in children. We are engaged in aggressive neglect of our children, one out of four kids in poverty. Uh, we're right next to Mexico in the international rankings on children in poverty. Uh, when we had the Great Society and the anti-poverty programs that were going on in the 60s and the 70s, which also were accompanied by desegregation assistance and investments in uh, student loans and financial aid to college, and many of you probably went into teaching, as I did, on the National Defense Student Loans or in the Urban Teacher Corps. The young ones don't even know what I'm talking about, but <laughs> the older ones. Uh, there was so much. And what happened in that period of time is we cut the achievement gap by two-thirds. The black-white uh, reading gap dropped by two-thirds over a, a period of about 15 years. Uh, and had we continued those programs and policies, we would have had no achievement gap by the year 2000. What happened was in 1981, most of those programs were ended or cut back, and by the end of the 1980s, we'd lost most of that infrastructure for investment and equity in, in our children. Uh, we need to bring that back. It is time. Uh, and so, yes, there are resource issues. Over there. All right. We've got two people standing, so we'll take you for, yeah, you gentlemen there, and then this, this lady. Yes, age before beauty. So beauty, you wait. Age, you go ahead. And you're talking about beginning teachers? Yes. Yeah. So the high proportion of beginning teachers who leave. Um, yes. I mean, this is a huge issue. And I'm finishing an international teacher policy study now with my colleague Dion Burns, who's sitting on the floor there, and some other colleagues who may be in the room, but I can't see you. Um, and one of the things we notice is that there are such low attrition rates in many of the countries that we're studying, 2 or 3 percent attrition rates. Uh, maybe four. Our attrition rate in the United States overall has been about eight to nine percent a year in the recent years. Um, and so, you know, you've got a big difference there. And for beginning teachers, about 30 percent perhaps leave in five years. Some estimates are smaller than that, actually. And it depends on the slice of history that you are looking at. Uh, but always higher in high need communities and districts, right? Where the uh, salaries and working conditions tend to be poorer, and we've had perennial shortages in math and science, and special education is a five-alarm fire across the country. So all of those are really critically important. What do we know about what helps us keep beginning teachers? First of all, the more preparation they've had, the better preparation they've had, the longer they stay. So um, Richard Ingersoll found that the rate of leaving is twice as high for people who have not had student teaching and who have not had uh, work around child development, learning, and curriculum than it is for people who have had, for individuals who've had that training. So we can be sure that people who come in get better training. That would help us. Uh, obviously, you get, you know, it's exhausting to, you know, not know what to do. Uh, mentoring makes a huge difference. You can reduce attrition by being sure that beginning teachers you know, have the mentoring that they need. And there's some wonderful models in the country, peer assistance and review programs in a number of cities around the country. As, are you a Californian? Yeah, I don't even want to say, you know, BITSA was the pride and joy, our beginning teacher program, but I think we're going to be rebuilding that in some important ways. Uh, so those are two things that will make a very big difference. Uh, obviously, you've got to equalize salaries and working conditions. 
There are always districts that have no trouble getting teachers because they pay good wages and they offer good working conditions. The shortage problem is that nobody wants to work for low wages in bad conditions. And so, and we have this inequality. So quite often we don't differentiate that the problem in part is equalizing the resources of districts so that they can provide um, competitive wages. So that's, you know, it's a hard nut to crack, but in California we are on the way as LCFF gets funded um, for, for that to happen as well. And then we need to say, Obama ran on this uh, slogan, um, I'm still waiting, tick tock, tick tock, if you will teach we will pay for your education. And if, <laughs> if we did that, uh, and, and by the way, that is the case in Singapore and Finland and um, most of a teacher's freight is paid in Australia and Canada and so on. Um, because how are you going to ask people to go into an occupation that pays less than other college educated careers and go into debt at the same time? And there was an era where that was true, where if you would teach, the federal government was paying for your education and we need to do that again. Uh, and that's a federal role that uh, I think we need. But uh, I think that what we're turning the corner as um, layoffs have stopped and, and demand is increasing, uh, but we also have to rebuild programs. We've lost our infrastructure for special education training uh, in the country, another thing that's been cut in recent years. Um, and so there are, there are investments that need to go into that. And now we have beauty. Yeah. Beauty. <laughs> So the comment for those who couldn't hear it is that ESSA still says must uh, rather than may more often than it should and how do we move towards different image of what policy can accomplish. And I often, uh, I teach uh, from time to time policy courses and I always want to um, call up the work that uh, Lorraine McDonald uh, did at RAND years ago about the types of policy because we've got, almost gotten accustomed to the idea that policy is a mandate. But in fact, mandates work in only a few circumstances, like when you know what to do and it's an obvious thing, like the speed limit is 55. They don't always work then either, but you can enforce, but you can enforce it, right? Um, but there are inducements, there are capacity building incentives, there are all kinds of other policies and you're really making a request for us to develop those other policy tools and use them more productively. And I think it's going to be a process of, you know, educating um, ourselves and our policy community about the ways in which those tools are successful. Uh, we need the research that shows that when you do certain things without a mandate, uh, that you can get good outcomes from them. And we do have some of that research. Um, a lot of those practices in recent years have come from other countries and international research on the work that's been done in places that are taking a different approach is, uh, is going to be helpful to us. Uh, but also, um, I, I uh, described some of the state work that has gone on that relied on making the right investments in the right ways with the right amount of pressure and the right amount of support. Um, I will say, however, uh, there are many, many, many fewer musts in ESSA than there were in NCLB. And I wouldn't be surprised, you know, Lamar Alexander really led this process, Senator Lamar Alexander, who was a Republican, you know, a ranking member of the uh, Senate Help Committee. He wanted this bill, um, and he wanted it to be about states having the opportunity to figure out what to do. Now, that causes anxiety, you know, from those of us who have reason to worry that some states will not be enlightened uh, or know what to do and will not have um, equitable intentions in mind. Uh, but uh, there is, it is really much more about uh, a permissive frame than it is a mandated frame. What states must do is they must continue to give tests. 
Uh, and that has been, there was a big, as you know, probably a big bone of contention about, do we really need to test kids every year, et cetera, et cetera. At the end of the day, that was um, determined that they were gonna keep that structure, but the law says you can have a variety of assessments throughout the year and roll them up into a score and they can include performance assessments. The law does not require that you use them as an immediate decision maker for any decision as the old law did. Uh, the law has a pilot project for seven states and then others later who can innovate as New Hampshire is doing where they're doing locally developed performance assessments, common performance tasks um, and substituting those for the standardized tests in many years for the districts who are engaged in this um, project that they're doing, uh, which was part of their state waiver. So there is a lot of room that was not in No Child Left Behind. And I think if that is used well, we might get to an era of policy making that is less oriented around mandates and more around capacity building. Over here, yes. Wonks, makers. <laughs> So the question is, how do we do this kind of work where we connect our work to the broader work in the field? Uh, I'm going to start with just a little story about um, what Jeannie sponsored with um, the White House and a variety of other policymakers. Has it been just a month ago? Yeah, February. Yeah. Um, so the idea was to see if we could get research into a framework that it could be helpful to policymakers, and there was a a blended audience uh, for this, TED Talks by researchers and all kinds of things. Um, and one of the things that came out of that from the staffers on the Hill and people in the White House was uh, the importance of synthetic work. When we're trying to figure out what to do, we need to know, you know, time after time, over and over again, what does the bulk of the evidence say? Um, and so they were really encouraging that. Now, not everybody has to do that work, but more of us have to do it and get it in a form that it can be used and read. But you know, the age-old beginning of a dissertation is the literature review, and uh, <laughs> we need to honor that literature review. We need each person to understand that field that they're swimming in and what came before. You probably have had students, as I have, who say, oh, I can't do that study because it's been, somebody did something on that before. It's like, no, that's exactly why you should do your study and build the field of knowledge in that domain. But there's this idea that it has to be like brand new and nobody ever thought about it, nobody ever did work on it that a lot of young scholars come in with. So um, we need to uh, build that uh, capacity to honor and understand what's going on in the field. And then when you get that really cool thing that you did and learned, you can place it in a broader set of activities, innovations, whatever it is, and say, well, how is that like other things? Or what do we know about the context within which this is likely to be helpful or can be implemented? Or what will be the strategies that will be needed for it to succeed? In other words, to take that finding and then put it in a broader context. And I think that will allow us to be more helpful. Yes, over here. So, so my question is that in assessing directors of high school students, I would think you need to use instructional based or state assessment and using high training officers in your testing structure. What do you think about this and what do you I didn't hear all of it. It was something about uh, 
instructors being testing proctors? Right. I mean, that's a that's an administrative, you know, matter. You can decide that you're going to have. And New York's done that for years with the regents. Is that there are certain, you know, days are not instructional days where you take and then teachers actually score, you know, the regents exams. Um, so I think that's a, a question of how you want to think about the administration. But I but another way to think about this is. Um, Whatever we do in terms of sit-down tests, that's one kind of information. The question of how to make that useful for instruction and how to combine whatever we learn from that kind of assessment with embed curriculum embedded assessments that are richer, more descriptive, more uh, powerful forms of activity and learning as well as um, information, how we do that in the instructional program, I think is equally important. And you're nodding, so that's obviously part of what you were worrying about as well. So I, I think there's a couple of things here. One, uh, for the sit-down tests, um, you know, it, uh, Smarter Balanced uh, has uh, performance tasks in English language arts and math. Um, I talked to um, uh, a kid at High Tech High, which is a project-based school. Some of you might have seen the film Most Likely to Succeed, which has been out lately talking about that. And asked about the old tests and the new tests. And he said the old tests, the California Standards tests, you know, they were hard because they were tricky because they were always trying to trick you. Um, the new tests are hard because they make you think, but I feel really well prepared for them because of the project-based learning I've done, because there's more of a common thinking process critical thinking process that I'm experiencing. So a part of the question for teachers is how you embed all of that other kind of work in the curriculum. And could we get to the point where we are, like um, Queensland or Victoria or Singapore or the UK, counting those performance tasks as part of the ultimate score? Um, and when we're trying to uh, figure out what kids have done and providing teachers with that data. There was a project done in four states last year where teachers scored the performance tasks for Smarter Balanced and then talked about the curriculum implications with each other as part of professional development. The findings from that, WestEd did it with uh, scale at Stanford, were unbelievable. More than 95% of the teachers said this was tremendous professional development. They understood the standards more fully. They were taking lessons back to their classrooms about how to build performance assessment into their work. They were, uh, they felt teachers should do this routinely. Of course, this is what teachers do uh, in other countries and what they do in places like New York around the regents exams. But we've kept testing so far away from teachers as those, and in fact, when I was in Australia, I was talking about testing and the teachers were like, well, don't the teachers get to see the tests? I said, oh no, they're secret. They're in brown paper wrappers and they come in with seals on them. And they said, well, if they don't get to see the assessments, how do they know what to teach? They just couldn't like get next to that, that notion that it's like so separated. Um, so we need to build, again, that capacity for the assessments to be integrated in instruction uh, and have these other kinds of performance components as well, like the kids in Singapore doing the science examinations. Um, that kind of thing can be part of what we think of as instruction and assessment. I was uh, also just looking at um, data from our international study. Anne, you're here, and you wrote this part about how the teachers in New South Wales were learning so much more from looking at student work than they ever felt they learned from looking at a two-digit score or a three-digit score from a test. So that's the other part of you know, this idea that we'd learn from data, from scores. Uh, you can learn a little bit. But you really don't see what kids' conceptions are and how they're working and all of that until you look at the student work. So that's got to be part of it. And I think that's part of what you're getting at there. 
Jeannie, I'm gonna let you. <laughs> this feels like Sophie's Choice or something. Okay. Uh, We've got like just a couple minutes. Right there, we'll have one or two more, and then we'll. Just this lady here, we just oh, she's okay. like, ooh. Okay. Okay. <laughs> oh, okay. Beauty, be Beauty before <laughs> Go ahead. Wow. So the question is integration in ESSA. Um, where where does it stand in the legislation, and what's my personal perspective on it? Um, well, I benefited from it, so I'm, I have a strong personal perspective on it. But um, you know, it's buried in there as a permissive thing that you can use resources for. But what's remarkable to me is that it's mentioned in the law at all because it was taken entirely off the table in the 1980s. We took off the table, any discussion of resources, money doesn't matter, it's all about the outcomes, and we took off the table any discussion of integration. And we built this more and more segregated system with the apartheid schools that have been growing uh, in recent years. Um, so it's very important that it be back on the table, and I'm actually so thrilled that uh, Secretary John King is really committed to seeing what can be done to really promote that. And there's, um, who knows what will happen with the president's budget, but there is some money in the budget to augment that strategy. Some years ago, uh, Jeannie and I and lots of other people signed a brief in, uh, I think it was Parents uh -huh. versus Seattle. Parents involved, right? Yeah, Parents Involved versus Seattle, about which summarized a lot of the research on the benefits of integration. And there's an enormous body of work, and Amy Stewart Wells was very involved in organizing that, so we need to give her a shout out. Um, but there's an enormous body of work uh, about the benefits of integration, uh, socioeconomic, uh, cross language, uh, you know, cross race, et cetera, both for uh, social interactions, but also for academic uh, achievement and um, community well-being and, and a variety of other things. So I think we need to do that. I mean, how can you be the United States of America with the values that this country purports to hold and not have an active agenda to bring and educate people together. We can't, we can't be the United States of America that way. Hey, by the way, Amy. Yeah. interested on the Teachers College Columbia website, Amy Stewart Wells <laughs> has a brand new synthesis bringing together the research on the benefits of diversity. And it was impressive when we signed the brief. It's even more impressive now, so I, I recommend that to you. So we have, let's have one more and then we'll call it an afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my question is, because of my field is actually in psychology, so I always interested in how students learn and what the learning conditions. So I'm very, very excited to see now we are shifting our attention from the learning outcomes to the learning conditions. So my question is, uh, I lived in the U.S. before. I also feel like the educational policy in the U.S. is very fashion to come and go. Yeah. <laughs> Well, in my ideal world, we would have a system that is tightly integrated in a way that um, educators, as they uh, learn and teach and um, gain knowledge of children and schools and systems, also have opportunities to become leaders who lead districts and states and the equivalent of ministries of education, um, so that the system as a whole is built on 
common knowledge base. One of the things I'm impressed by when I'm looking at many of these other systems is that the ministries and departments of education are full of people who are steeped in educational practice and research. And they then try to use what they're learning from practice and research in a continuous improvement cycle over many, many years to improve the system. And there is a buffer around them often from politics, uh, from the pendulum swings that we experience where you know a new party comes in and they say get rid of all that stuff and we did that before we're not doing now we're going to do something else uh, your flavor of the month uh, and many of the people increasingly making those judgments have little or no experience in schools or in research about schools or both uh, and so we have less and less well grounded Policy. So my wish would be that we rebuild the capacity of the profession. Um, I think this is what Horace Mann had in mind and others after about how the systems would operate with um, building on knowledge. And I think in the states where you see tremendous gains were made over a period of time, they managed to be able to um, engage and operate um, more or less in that way, uh, saying, okay, what's working? How are we going to improve it? What's the next thing? We build on what we've got. We continue to uh, grow and learn. Uh, disruption has its place, but disruption is not a strategy to build a system on. We have to be in the construction business. We have to construct these systems on knowledge. Again, this is going to be a state-by-state -state matter. Um, and we're pretty close to our states. You know, you'd be surprised how accessible your state legislature could be to you um, and your Department of Education, even in a big state like California. Um, part of it is coming out of the cubby holes, the different places where we live, and building community uh, across those barriers. Thank you. Well, thanks to all of you. Enjoy the conference. Uh, have fun and make your way carefully out of this room. <laughs> take, take care of each other. <laughs>